In this episode of Brain Ponderings, it's my pleasure to talk with Heck Young Lee, who's a professor of neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University. She's also uh, in the Mind Brain Institute at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and so Heck Young is an expert on what happens to synaptic connections when experiences of animals occur or when they don't occur, which I think is what we're gonna talk mainly about today. Um, before we get into your research, could you kind of describe your path that led to you becoming a neuroscientist? You were, you grew up in South Korea. Did you get interested in neuroscience when you were an undergraduate or before that? Um, yeah, so I grew up in Korea. So um, I actually was a biology major in, in university. Um, my main interest actually was in, you know, molecular biology. So I wanted to be a molecular biologist uh, in the future. Um, but then at some point I was trying to go uh, do an exchange program abroad and it came up that I could actually go for a year during my junior year to Brown University. So I thought that would be great. I actually wasn't convinced. I actually wanted to go to Berkeley. So I did sign up for Berkeley and Brown, but then uh, my father, who actually is a professor, said, why don't you go to Brown? Because that, you know, is a private university. You'll never be able to go there because I can't support you going there. So just take this opp opportunity for the exchange program and go to Brown. So I said, okay, I guess I can go to Brown. Although I was really keen on going to Berkeley because they had a lot of molecular biology people there. But then I went to Brown and I realized they had these interesting uh, courses that are related to neuroscience. <laughs> Um, and one of them was Neuro 101, which uh, was team taught, but actually Mark Baer, who ended up being my PhD mentor, was one of the lecturers. And I remember sitting in this gigantic hall that holds about 400 students, uh, listening to his lecture on the cellular basis of how memories could be formed. That just blew my mind away. And I said, that's it. I want to go and study this thing. So that's when I decided I wanted to be a neuroscientist. So without Mark Baer, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so yeah, and then... Did you know what you were getting yourself into in terms of putting electrodes on, on individual neurons and recording from them, which is not a, not a trivial technique? Could you could you describe how you you know how you go about looking at synaptic communication in? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. So basically, in order to study how neurons communicate and, you know, transmit information, you have to actually record like the electrical signals that they actually propagate as well as convey across the synapses. So I had to learn how to do electrophysiology, which was a brand new technique. Um, and I was not never familiar with that. Although it had to do with electricity, which I was always, you know, I was I, I was interested in physics when I was growing up because my father was a physicist. Uh, um, so uh, it was kind of interesting to know they can use this uh, physics concept to actually study biology. Um, so I became interested in also in like, you know, physical biology or biological physics. Um, so it was uh, kind of interesting to know that we can actually use those uh, measurements that are physical that can actually understand the biological processes. Um, obviously, trying to record from neurons. I ended up doing uh, population field potential recordings, as you probably know. So it's basically recording from a group of neurons to look at their synaptic transmission, which is a little bit easier technique than trying to do intracellular recordings, which I ended up doing a later part of my PhD. Yeah. So those, it was kind of interesting because you can see exactly how the synaptic transmission is propagated across the synapse in real time because you can record those things. And then when you do manipulation, either they go up or down to produce uh, synaptic potentiation or depression. So it was really uh, intriguing that you can actually see these things happening in front of your eyes. So that's one thing I enjoy about electrophysiology is that you can actually know the results right away. Yeah. So it's almost like an instant feedback, um, yeah. so instant gratification. But of course, the downside is when things don't work, then you get instant disappointment. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, but it's always, you know, one issue in science in general is that there can be a lot of variability between individual animals or individual neurons even. So you still have to do record from a lot of 
neurons are, are due from a lot of different animals in your case in order to do the statistics. Uh, so it's very, it's time consuming, although you get immediate feedback, you know, for the, the neurons, either population of neurons or individual ones you're recording from, it takes a lot of time to uh, accumulate data from enough Animal. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, so you have to have some patience because you have to repeat the experiment over and over again just to convince yourself which, which, you know, that you, what you're seeing is real. And that's the part that sort of um, is sometimes very, um, I guess, is demanding, I guess. That's one of the challenges of being a graduate student is learning how to overcome those uh, difficulties. But sometimes you get an amazing result the first time around and then you can never yeah. replicate it and you're yeah. like, oh no, <laughs> oh, it's no. just a fluke. <laughs> So then you have to sort of overcome the disappointment and say, okay, what, what is going on? How can I redesign the experiment to do this? And I had a lot of these disappointments during my graduate work. Um, so it was a great learning experience because I feel like um, I got to learn how to overcome uh, disappointments as well as when experiments don't work out, what is the next step? And that's something I really value learning from Mark Barrett because he was an amazing mentor in terms of guiding me through all the different difficulties and you know, making through my project. And I think without his guidance, I would have been totally disappointed and probably packed up and went back home. <laughs> and so in your PhD work, you focused on the hippocampus, which is the most heavily studied brain region with regards to learning and memory and the changes in synapses that, that are thought to be the cellular basis for learning and memory. And so what was your major to, finding in your PhD work? Yeah, so my PhD thesis ended up being uh, developing this new method of inducing long-term depression, which is a way uh, wow. synapses get weaker, um, yeah. which called chemical LTD. And this actually was a project that was brought to me by Mark Baer, who actually went to one of the conferences and came back all very excited saying, everybody's trying to develop this chemical LTP protocol, which is the opposite, which is strengthening of synapses. And he said, you know what? I think we have to do the LTD because it will be easier. Um, and he had a very good rationale. And I, if you know Mark Baer, he's a very convincing person. So he made this very logical argument as to why it will be much easier to do chemical LTD. And he said, because LTP requires high frequency stimulation, he thought it was gonna be very difficult to mimic that using chemical you know, applications. LTD, on the other hand, requires low frequency stimulation for a long time. So he thought it's perfect. It can be manipulated by a chemical application and the duration could be flexible. So it's more likely you'll get this kind of um, uh, protocol developed. So I thought that would be very cool. And he actually said, this is you know, um, the holy grail of neuroscience, he said. <laughs> Yep. If you develop this, then it opens up a whole door in which you can study the molecular basis for how these plasticity happens. So, of course, I got very pumped up and said, oh, I really want to do this project. And I didn't actually know what I was getting into because um, I didn't know where I should start, first of all. <laughs> what chemical should I be using? Um, so we went by a very simple thing that, you know, we knew LTP, LTD both had to require NMDA receptors. Um, so we said, okay, well, let's just at least have NMDA be one of the chemicals. But I always and then, thought- and, that, and, uh -huh. NMD, for, for listeners who don't have a neuroscience oh, background, yeah. can you talk about the glutamate, which is the, the excitatory transmitter throughout the brain and, and the fact that you're looking at uh, communication between neurons that's mediated by the neurotransmitter glutamate? Sure, I can step back and tell about glutamate too, but it turns out you actually wrote a book about glutamate, so maybe that would be the more interesting way to go about it. But in any case, glutamate is an interesting chemical in the brain because the information transfer requires excitatory synaptic connections, and the majority of these excitatory connections utilize glutamate as neurotransmitter. So that was, that's the important chemical that actually transmits information through the neural circuitry. Um, and of course, glutamate, when it's released by neurons, bind to several glutamate receptors on the next neuron. And one of them is the regular AMPA receptors, which propagates the inflammation. But then there's a second class of receptors that bind glutamate that are called NMDA receptors, which have a very interesting property that they can actually detect coincidence between 
presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. So we call it coincident detectors. And that's why they're supposed to be important for memory formation because memories are formed when there's coincident firing between neurons. So, uh, you know, that's why NMD receptors are a very important molecule because they can actually produce changes in the brain circuitry. Um, and then they can lead to a whole bunch of different uh, chemical changes inside the neurons to actually consolidate those changes as needed. Now, the, you talked about LTD, uh, which is a, re, a reduction in the strength of synapses. And the discovery that LTD is important in learning and memory was at kind of first approximation a big surprise. But then when you, you know, you're talking about the specificity of the inputs, which you're going to get into when we talk about the, the visual and auditory systems and how they interact. Um, so learning and memory requires that uh, synapses that are specifically activated in response to say what we're doing now, right? Yeah. Uh, are, their activity increases, but then the strength, the, the formation of the memory can actually be enhanced by reducing the activity activation of other synapses that are not synapses involved in the information coming in. Is that, am I explaining that right? <laughs> yeah, so that's one way to see it. Yeah. Um, but the other way to see that is that if you have a binary code, which is zeros and ones, you can encode more than just, a, you know, by zeros, you can't really, really encode anything if you just have a single mode of changing the synapses. So in terms of having the synapses have actually be able to strengthen versus weaken, now you have like three codes, right, in, at the synapses, either synapses stay the same, they get stronger, they get weaker. So the combination of those strengthening weakening can actually encode a lot more information than just having LTP okay. alone. So okay. I always think about it as a way that it would increase the capacity to store information. And as you said, one function LTD would provide is sharpening that information, right? So getting rid of the ones that are not as relevant and just strengthening and making that difference much bigger. But if you purely want to think about it in terms of computational point of view, then having LTP, LTD together actually can enormously increase the capacity of information storage. And so your PhD work, you were at able to identify a, a chemical that will will cause LTD. Yeah. What, what's the chemical? It was actually NMDA, which is the agonist for the NMDA receptors. Oh, the agonist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so how, does, how does that work? Because you think uh, <laughs> if you activate that receptor, it's going to en enhance the strengthening of the synapse. That's exactly what people thought, and that's what I thought too, because LTP requires a lot of NMDA receptor activation, as you know, and the convention was LTD requires just a moderate level of NMDA receptor activation. So the key was to titrate the chemical down that we're actually trying to get this moderate quote unquote activity was my goal initially. Um, but then I, because I was raised to think that ND receptor activation uh, actually is involved in LTP, I thought LTD had to do had something else going on, like I had to dampen the activity somehow so you don't get overactivation with NMDA. And also, uh, people have knew, known by then that NMDA receptor activation um, can actually cause excitotoxic neuronal damages. So I wanted to avoid all that. So initially, I was pairing NMDA you know, receptor agonist NMDA with a different chemical that can actually dampen activity or increase inhibition. So I was trying a whole bunch of different cocktails of, of drugs, as you can imagine, um, and also different doses of the NMDA just to see what will work. And sometimes I would get results and sometimes I get weird results. And by the end, I would have different combinations of different drugs that I, I would apply. But I couldn't figure out the pattern. Like I would say, they all go up and down in some way, but I don't know what is the common denominator here. <laughs> so then I will bring all my data into Mark Bear's office and then say, hey, Mark, I have all these results, but I don't know what to make of it. And he, he will just put it out in his desk and he will look at all the graphs and say, oh, look at this, this and that, that has LTD. And then he says, these are the common drugs that you are using. So now go back and repeat that and try to change the combinations or the, the doses. So then after doing those repetitions several times, 
it turned out it was just NMDA <laughs> huh. at a certain dose was reliably inducing LTD and didn't matter what he paired with. So I decided, all right, I'll just go. So he said, Mark Bear told me just do NMDA at this dose. So I did that and it worked beautifully. So then I was con at least convinced that it can produce synaptic depression, but then trying to convince myself that I wasn't killing neurons was another story. <laughs> And this is an interesting anecdote. I always try to tell my students because it sort of tells you sometimes you discover things unexpectedly. Uh, for instance, I was always con concerned that I was bath applying an MDA and you were actually causing synaptic depression, not because you know it's actually plasticity, but you're killing off some neurons, right? Because then the responses will get smaller. <laughs> So then I decided to do an intracellular recording from the neuron to just say, see that the neuron is still there. But that's yeah. how I became involved in learning how to do intracellular recordings. So I learned how to do intracellular recordings from a single neuron. I will put on the NMDA and guess what? <laughs> the membrane potential goes to zero and it becomes a flat line. And I was like, oh, I killed the neuron, pull out the electro, go back to another cell, slice, another cell, you know, do the recordings put on an MDA, zero millivolt, flat line. I'm like, oh no. I did it a few times um, for at least a couple of days. And at some point I was doing that experiment and I watched an MDA and it went to flat line. And I said, oh no, I need a break. So I went to have coffee with my graduate, my graduate student friend. And I came back after about half an hour chit-chatting and complaining to her how these things were killing neurons. Actually, the cell recovers up at about 10 minutes and then goes back and it produces long-term depression. So basically, of course, you're depolarizing everything. So the neurons undergo this thing called the depolar regeneration block. So you don't get any responses. But then as the cell recovers back down, they produce nice, beautiful long-term depression. So it sort of tells you unexpectedly, if you have a coffee break, you might discover something. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't have that break, I would never, I would have just thrown out that project and say, Mark is killing neurons. I'm going to move on. <laughs> so. um, did, what, what are the implications uh, of your findings there for uh, the potential for drugs to enhance learning and memory? Um, in other words, you're recording from these brain slices. If you give NMDA in vivo in, in a living mouse or rat, at a certain, is there a certain dose that can en actually enhance their performance in some tests of learning and memory? Uh, I am not aware of it. Um, and the whole purpose of our study was not to develop something that can actually produce or enhance memory because as you can imagine, Bath applying a chemical would produce massive LTD across all yeah. the synapses and all the yeah. neurons, or at least majority of them. So it would be very nonspecific. And the only reason why we developed this was because of uh, Mark Beer's vision that this can be used to produce massive amounts of LTD that we can actually detect those molecular correlates using biochemistry. Um, so we just developed it as a way to collect tissue that has a lot of LTD to analyze them to understand the biochemical and molecular changes associated with it. But it was never intended to uh, produce you know, plasticity in vivo because I would imagine if you dump that much NMDA on your brain, you will shut down everything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, let's get into the the main part of the of this conversation uh, and your 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 work on sensory pathways, the neural pathways from your eyes to your brain, your ears, touch, and um, so can you maybe you should start out by talking about humans who are blind uh, or deaf and what evidence there was from humans that, for example, when someone's blind, that there, there occur changes uh, either in the visual pathway or maybe other sensory pathways that enable them to compensate to some extent for their sensory deficit. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so that's my current lab project. So it's called cross-modal plasticity. So it's basically a plasticity that happens across sensory modalities when you lose one of the senses. And that, you know, I initially did not want, you know, I was not intending to study cross-modal plasticity. This was a project that got studied when I became independent as a PI. Yeah. Um, and when I was setting up my lab, um, as, you, as you probably know, during my postdoctoral year, I worked with Rick Huguenier looking at all the molecular changes associated with plasticity, including AMPA receptor regulation. And um, I decided I wanted to look at more in vivo preparations because obviously I was doing everything in the hippocampus um, using electrical stimulation to induce plasticity. But I thought I would like to see what happens with real experience. Do the same molecular signatures also happen when you actually form memories with real experience in the circuit? So the obvious circuit to look at is a sensory circuit because we know the inputs and we know where to look at to look at the consequences of altering sensory experience. So I decided to look at the visual, visual cortex because that's one of the preparations I learned when I was in Mark Baer's lab because he studied the visual cortex plasticity on the side as well. So I decided I will look at the visual cortex and see what happens in, when you manipulate the visual experience and then read out the molecular changes in the visual cortex. Um, so I decided, to, all right, let's do a very simple experiment. We'll compare what happens when you have vision and when you don't have vision, and then we'll go and look at the visual cortex and see what happens up to those synapses. Being a very naive person, I thought, all right, when you don't have vision, there's no activity or reduced activity, so you should see molecular signatures of long-term depression, which I know involves dephosphorylation of AMPA receptors. So then I had you know, graduate students and undergrads you know, doing these experiments. So I had told my graduate student to go and do the recording so we can measure the synaptic transmission after losing vision in the visual cortex. And then I had a, you know, an undergrad, a very, very talented undergraduate, as a matter of fact, who actually did all the biochemistry, which involves you know, biochemical isolation of postsynaptic density, which is not a very easy prep to do. But anyway, so I sent those two to do the experiment. And then after a while, my grad student came back and said, mm, they're actually not getting smaller. They're actually getting bigger with, the dark, with, with visual deprivation. And I said, no, that can't be right. It has to get weaker. It has, it has to produce long-term depression. And then uh, my uh, graduate. But, uh -huh. but actually, uh, yeah, if they do it again and get the same result, then you're pretty sure it's right because it's the opposite of what you're predicting. Exactly. So I was. So there's like, there's oh. no, you know, um, experiment or bias, which can be a, a problem in science that someone. Yeah, so that means at least she wasn't making up data, right? Yeah, <laughs> she was yes. reporting to me exactly what she saw because totally against the hypothesis. Yeah. But that's the thing. And then my undergrad came back showing me data that actually the molecular changes were correlates of long term potentiation. <laughs> we are seeing increase in phosphorylation. So at least the physiology and the biochemistry are going in the same direction. So I knew there was something going on, but it was totally And, and was this, you, you completely cover the eyes of the animals or how, yeah, so how do you- so we actually put them in a dark room. So it's called oh. the zero photon environment. We actually oh. call it that way to make it sound fancy. <laughs> oh, that's- so We see the yeah. animal in total darkness, so they don't see anything. So they lose completely their vision. Okay. Yeah, and then we, we take them out and then you do the recordings from the visual cortex and then you also do biochemical analysis of the synaptic proteins in the visual cortex. So then I said, all right, maybe we're not, like maybe we're getting outside the visual area. Maybe we are, you know, sampling other brain areas too. So let's do like very, very conservative. We just record from very narrow region of V1. We know we're not gonna get out of the boundary. I told my undergrad, you have to now do dissections much more, you know. Uh, conservatively so we don't get any other tissue than just the visual cortex so I had them go back and redo them and they gave back the same results <laughs> and in the beginning as I don't know maybe I'm just not very smart I was like oh totally disappointed that we're getting this very opposite result and I was it took me like weeks to even figure out what was going on I was like no, not having any idea why they should be an increase in synaptic transmission when there's no vision to drive changes sure. and then there's a little bit of stress when it comes to publishing your findings because you say boy I sure hope this is right I know but also it's like if you have to have some explanation if you want to publish it I can't yeah. just go and say this is what we find and we have no yeah. idea yeah 
So it took me a long time. And uh, by then, um, luckily, we had, um, you know, Gina Trigena's group had just come up with the idea of homeostatic synaptic scaling. And that that I sort of learned when I went to the Society for Neuroscience. Heck, 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 before you talk about the, the homeostatic plasticity, can you talk about, because this I was reading one of your review articles, and so I wasn't really aware of that there's actually a literature on looking at people who are blind and doing functional brain imaging and looking at showing that uh, essentially my understanding is, so blind people use braille, right? So they use uh, touch mm -hmm. to read. And so can you describe the evidence in humans that when blind people, when they're doing braille, uh, there's actually changes in the visual cortex. Yes, um, so that's actually, um, you know, the, the literature that I started following once we started seeing these weird changes. And basically what's known in blind humans is that uh, their visual cortex gets recruited for processing the remaining senses. So when they do imaging of the brain activity in blind subjects, uh, they find activation of the visual areas when people are reading Braille, which is yeah. a tactile information, as well as in some cases when they're actually processing speech, which is auditory information. So that sort of so that tells you that when an area of the brain does not get its own sensory inputs, then it can be recruited to process other information that's out there. And I think that's probably very biological because biology, you want to conserve every single bit. So if there's something that's not being used, you have to use it for something else. Um, so that's what we call cross-modal plasticity. Uh, but also there's evidence that blind um, uh, people tend to have um, better tactile acuity or discrimination abilities, although those that literature is always very mixed when I was reading the, uh, the literature. It's not something I do. So there's some known facts that, you know, somehow when you lose vision, you can enhance the other modalities uh, that are left behind um, and become more efficient at it. So um, that's, that's the basis of cross-modal plasticity. Um, well, and then, so in, in someone who's not blind, if you were to just acutely, when the person's in the scanner doing functional MRI, um, if you, whatever, if you blind them just for like a minute uh, and then um, have them do some tactile thing. Oh, how would you do this? I guess what I'm saying is uh, how long does it take for the for this plasticity to occur? Is it like instant or? No, it's not instant. Okay. Actually, there is a group that did that study. Um, it's a group in Harvard uh, led by Pascal Leon. Um, and they actually blind temporarily blindfolded adult subjects for five days. And then they uh, subjected them to a crash course on braille reading. And oh. they all, of course had a sighted you know, control group where they also did the crash course on braille reading. And then they did functional MRI at, uh, across several days to see what's happening in their brain activity when they're actually reading braille. And their results are very intriguing because after five days, the blindfolded groups actually read braille fast, I mean, better, meaning that they learn faster than the control group that are not, they have normal vision. And also when they start doing the functional MRI, which is to measure the brain activity while they're reading braille, they find that the blindfolded subjects actually uh, start activating the primary visual cortex when they're reading braille. And furthermore, just to convince themselves that this activity in the visual area is responsible for that net gain in braille reading ability, they uh, disrupted that activity using transcranial magnetic stimulation when the blindfolded subject was reading Braille and their performance decreases to the level of the control side. Oh my group. God, wow. So that basically tells you that it, it requires like five days in their case. So, but it does require some training from what I can tell. So it's not just not having vision is important, uh, but the fact that you're not having vision and you're actually using the other sense to learn how to read Braille, uh, you can gain a little bit of advantage if you don't have the visual, visual input. And then so, in someone who's deaf, do the um, 
does the auditory cortex where the the sound information goes to are there changes there in in response to uh vision or touch input yeah so that's also been shown by other groups where they where they also did similar study in deaf individuals and what they found is that there was significant activation of the auditory cortex by visual stimuli uh, it had to be pretty high contrast visual stimuli but still normal individuals don't get that activation but deaf individuals do so it seems like these kind of cross-modal recruitment we call um, actually happens across the different sensory uh, systems. Okay, so now uh, let, let's, go, let's go back to the, <laughs> talk about cross-modal uh, plasticity. Yeah, uh, so- Talk, talk could, about uh -huh. something else, homeostatic plasticity. What is that? All right, so we can catch back on what I was, you know, I was trying yeah, to tell yeah. you. So homeostatic plasticity is a little bit different than long-term potentiation, long-term depression. Uh, the need for this is to maintain stability in the neural networks. Um, so it has been actually brought up several times, even prior to synaptic scaling model that came out more recently, that in order for the neural network to be stably performing while they're changing all their synaptic connections up and down, you definitely need something else to provide stability uh, such that they don't undergo runaway excitation or runaway depression. So one of the more prominent uh, theories that was brought up uh, early on to talk about, you know, to, to suggest this maintenance of stability actually is called sliding threshold model that was actually worked on by Leon Cooper and Mark Baer. So I'm a little bit more familiar with that one because I learned it as a graduate student was working in Mark's lab. Um, so that is one mode of providing stability, but then another mode is by uh, synaptic scaling, which is occurs by globally up and down regulating synapses um, to compensate for long-term potentiation, long-term depression kind of changes. So what we what basically I was I was trying to tell you is that when you visually deprive the animal, I thought naively you're inducing long-term long depression because you're not getting activity. But since there's no activity for a long time, because we're depriving for several, several days, now we're hitting into homeostatic regulation. The, set, the neurons are in the brain are saying, hey, I don't get any activity, so I'm going to just upregulate all my synapses now so I can detect any little signal that's out there so I can maintain my activity to what it was before. So when I thought about it that way, uh, then my results made perfect sense. Like there's no, you know, basically the synapses are potentiating when there's no input. So that was really cool. So I decided, oh, this is great. And that was going to be my first paper from my new, brand new lab. So I started writing a paper. And of course, being a first person, you know, new person, I decided to give my manuscript to everybody I knew to get feedback before publishing. And one of them was actually Alfredo. I gave it to him and said, hey, can you read my first paper and see if, I, if it sounds good? Did I miss anything? And he came back to me and said, you know what? You're missing a critical control. And I said, oh no, <laughs> what control am I missing? <laughs> And then he actually said, well, you need to show that it's specific to the visual area. What if, you know, it's a global change across all the, the brain area because oh. the animal cannot see and maybe it's something to do with them being stressed out and you're regulating everybody in the brain. Oh, yeah. I said, well, that's a good point. So then I'll do another control, just look at a different brain area. And then uh, after a few thoughts, I thought, oh, maybe I'll look at the hippocampus because they don't get visual input directly. They must not change. And then Alfredo say, hey, you're cheating there uh, because hippocampus is not the same structure as a neocortex it's not a six-layered cortical structure it's not a neocortex so i said fair enough so i said then i'll look at the somatosensory cortex they have the same structure as the visual cortex they don't get vision um so then they should not undergo change when i deprive vision so i told my students to go back and record from somatosensory cortex and do the biochemistry in the somatosensory cortex in the in the blind animals uh, again, this was another surprise I had in my lifetime. Um, they came back and they, because I was expecting there will be no change. The change should be specific to the visual area. And they came back showing me results that barrel cortex or somatosensory cortex actually undergoes synaptic changes when you deprive vision. And they change in a way that go in opposite direction from what we saw in the visual cortex. Um, so again, I had to sit down and try to make sense of it because I never even thought about or knew about cross-modal plasticity back then. And it was very, it was 
so annoying to me at that point that when you deprive vision that the somatosensory cortex will change. So if it was changing the same direction, it would have been an easy interpretation because I could have said, well, there's something with not having vision. Everybody gets, you know, uh, you know, stronger because of some kind of, you know, stress-induced global change in the brain. But since they're regulated in opposite direction, I had to sort of make sense why that is. And also why would the somatosensory cortex synapses get weaker when, when you don't have vision? Don't you want to right. strengthen them so they can use the you know, senses better? So then it, it sort of daunted to me that, you know, there's, it was actually when I was commuting to Maryland um, and I was stuck in traffic, driving down there and started thinking about this and it sort of daunted to me, oh, don't blind people actually have better senses. And that's when I realized, oh, this might be a cross modal plasticity. So that's when I started reading on the human literature to see what's out there. And then it's, it made a lot of sense that uh, when you don't have vision, you wanna adapt the remaining cortical areas to process their information better. And the reason why the synapse is getting weaker is that they were uh, actually making the, the responses much more sh sharply tuned by decreasing the strength of most of the synapses. So in terms of that, that's my first discovery of cross modal plasticity at the hollow level. So Alfredo discouraged you from looking at, at hippocampal circuits, but so uh, for listeners and viewers, uh, information from all of the five of our senses kind of funnels into the hippocampus. And that's in a general sense why the hippocampus is so important for short term memory because it's essentially pairing a sound with a sight and uh, and so on and so i would think like if you if you blind an animal you know you'll have reduced information flow into the hippocampus through that and you might have some changes in the organization in the hippocampus has that been looked at it not as far as I know, but you have a very valid point because hippocampus is a, if you talk to people who actually study hippocampus, it's one of the highest order <laughs> brain area because it gets all the information from every part of the brain. So obviously it might be interesting, you know, influenced by not having vision, how they would change. I honestly don't know because we haven't looked at it. Um, well, and the hippocampus is particularly important in um uh, and remembering spatial relationships between things in the environment. Yeah, as right? well as temporal sequences too. So, it's and, like, and it's been mostly studied from that regard from visual input. Because like, for the most part, like the learning and memory tests that are done in animals are maze tests, where it's mm -hmm. mainly ba based on vision. Oh, yeah. I just thought of something. Uh huh. So we've talked about vision, hearing, touch. What about cross-modal plasticity with smell and taste? Has that been looked at at all? No, it has not been looked at. I think there's That's some another, people that's another grant, it. Another grant proposal. Has been. <laughs> Yeah, so there's okay. some group that's looking at changes in the olfactory system with uh, other sensory deprivation. So we know that happens. And also, you know, anecdotally, people have reported that, you know, uh, when you lose vision, that your sense of olfaction actually enhances. And I've been always curious about that, too. And one of the reasons why I want to look at the olfactory system at some point is that they're differently organized than the other senses, as you know. Like, for instance, vision, audition, and tech go through this midbrain structure called the thalamus, yeah. uh, but olfactory, you know, neurons have direct access to the olfactory cortex without the thalamus. Goes to the uncus. <laughs> yeah, so basically they're very differently organized and they have more influence from the limbic system, as you probably know. Um, so uh, the emotions. Exactly. So it'll be amazingly interesting to look at that. But so far, I have never had a chance to do that. I tried to convince one of my rotation students to look at it. But then we, we were too naive that we didn't realize there were so many different types of cells, which we presumably have to, you know, separate them out to look at them one by one. So we'll get there at some point, I hope. <laughs> Sorry, I had to mute my phone. I forgot to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me ask you, um, so you had a recent study published, well, it's been a few years ago now in one of the cell journals and 
your postdoc Gabriela Rodriguez was yeah, my graduate first... student. She was a graduate student, yeah. Oh, oh she's a graduate student. Yeah, she was, yeah. Oh, okay. Actually, I looked on the Hopkins website and she's listed as a postdoc. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, I don't know, but she was my graduate student. Okay, anyway. Now postdoc in Max Planck, Florida, so. Okay, so anyway, that, uh, yeah. Her, her work on this paper was it very important in her uh, securing a postdoc position. Can you describe the findings in a general sense in that paper and their exciting implications for essentially therapies or interventions for humans that have some sensory deficit? Because it's very, and it's another example in your career of something to say, oh, how can that be? That seems like the opposite of what you'd think. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, Gabriella, I mean, she was amazing because um, this was a project that sort of came around um, just by thinking about it. And by then we knew that uh, visual deprivation does a lot of things. And then we also started thinking about, all right, if you deafen the animals, will we see the same thing? So she decided to, you know, follow up that part of the cross-modal plasticity, seeing what happens when you auditory deprive the animal and then look at the visual cortex. And she found that when you do that, we see very similar changes in the visual cortex, which included strengthening of the feed forward circuit, we call it. Um, so basically these are the inputs coming from the periphery containing the visual information to your visual cortex. And those synapses actually get stronger when you don't have audition. And um, so that was very uh, in interesting for us because it sort of suggested to us, maybe this will be a way to recover strengthening in individual system. And why this was so exciting for us is because uh, Gabriella saw this in adult cortex. And if you probably know about development and how brain plasticity is dependent on age, you would know that you know when the adult in the adult brain, there's very limited amount of plasticity left. And that sort of uh, prevents a lot of the circuit reorganization when you uh, lose a sensory modality, as well as learning, as well as impacts a lot of capacity. Uh, and that's I, why I, I, I had some personal experience with the <laughs> remarkable ability of the uh, very young brain to adapt to injury. Um, yeah. My son, uh, when we moved here from Kentucky, my son was maybe, how old was he? I should know that. <laughs> He was like 10 years old. And he, it just happened that he had a friend from his school in Kentucky and that their family moved to the DC area at the same time. And his, his friend uh, was crossing the street and got hit by a car oh, no. and had severe traumatic brain injury. And he went to Kennedy Krager at Hopkins, which is like, Oh yeah, the best place to be actually. Best place yeah. in the world. And we'd go up at least once a week to see my son's friend. Uh, he was in a coma for a couple mm -hmm. weeks. And then he came out and then week by week, there was like progressive, you know, first just responding and then being able to kind of talk with kind of slurred speech. And, and he had, uh, problems to his motor cortex, sensory motor system, and he had to go through a lot of therapy. But over a period of about six months, he got to where he could function quite well. He graduated from high school and went to college. If if he would have been older, yeah. he would either be dead or have some Lifelong consequences, really yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. definitely. Oh, I'm I'm so glad to hear he recovered yeah. because yeah, there is a lot of evidence like that uh, coming from the literature of pediatrics neurology, and um, it's really amazing how rapid and also how amazingly well the young brain can adapt to that kind of uh, humongous insult. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples I've heard is actually hemispherectomy, where they have to somehow remove almost half of their cortex because of epilepsy on intractable epilepsy. Epilepsy. So these young patients have to undergo surgery to remove that large chunk of the brain. If that happens to adults, you'll never recover any 
functionality in the opposite side of your body. But these uh, young children actually somehow transfer all that to the remaining brain hemisphere and they recover motor control over the other side of the body, which I thought was amazing. So that sort of highlights the fact that the young brain is amazingly plastic. It can undergo reorganization even with these very severe insults to the system. And that's something we lose over the age. And uh, when I saw Gabriella's result, I thought, maybe we can utilize this to recover plasticity in the adult brain because we're able to drive these kind of synaptic strengthening processes that is lost in the adult brain by simply deafening the animal for a few days. So then she took on the challenge to actually test that in vivo. So she looked at this very interesting paradigm that was developed, you know, I guess, first discovered by people in Weasel a long time ago, yeah. where when you do um, monocular deprivation, that is when you lose vision through one eye, then the visual cortex reorganizes it such that it loses its, you know, um, responsiveness to the previously deprived eye, even if you reopen that eye later to correct uh, the vision. And we thought maybe we can use this uh, paradigm to recover that because basically what's happening, people, a lot of people have studied this process and what they realize is that when you don't have vision from one eye, that synaptic connection to the visual cortex gets weaker. So we thought, well, we have a way to recover synaptic strengthening using this cross-modal deprivation. If we deafen the an adult animals, and then reopen that eye, which would we actually recover this, uh, you know, reconnection of these very weak inputs. And we were able to show we can actually do that. So that was very encouraging for us. Yeah. So hopefully this can lead to some therapeutics because um, it will, so it only works for strengthening connections, but at, at least, you know, if there is a process that's lost, you know, in the adults that requires re-strengthening those connections, we feel like this kind of cross-modal sensory deprivation might be beneficial in recovering those. Have, have you talked with any neurologists at Hopkins or University of Maryland medical group that, who actually has a good trauma center but yeah. uh, about you know, doing some human study. Uh, that would because, be fabulous. Because, well, uh, you could be, you could do like I am. We're, we're both basic neuroscientists. And what I'm doing is I'm doing a lot of cheerleading uh, mm -hmm. of, of clinical people who, we did all this work on intermittent fasting effects on the brain. And, and so, um, yeah, I'm kind of helping and cheerleading clinical people do studies. So I, I don't do much, but I've kind of stimulated them to get excited about getting funding to do some human study. And Yeah, I mean, we would love to do it. But as you know, as you probably know, as being a basic scientist, I want to gather more evidence and make sure this is solid before I bring it over. Because what if there are other consequences? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So um, at least I need to understand yeah, how yeah, much, yeah. you know, how much audition do you need to deprive is one question because I presume humans can um, probably, um, you know, endure about a week or more of deafening, but um, well, if, I was just that thinking, would impact their, you know, daily lives, meaning that they have to somehow put themselves in this mode. I'm going to fix my visual problem. Therefore, I'm not going to hear anything. But that's going to be very, you know, if we can reduce it to something that, you know, that can work more with a milder form of deprivation, then that might work. Yeah. Well, um, you, you, you mentioned the, the, the nice human study where they showed that five days of uh, yeah, blindfolding. blinding and so I assume that was reversible, that these people didn't have any long-term deficits. Yeah, I wouldn't, yeah, they didn't mention anything, but that was also, if you read fine, read the fine prints in the method section, they had to exclude a few subjects because when you do these kind of blindfolding, uh, people start on the, having visual hallucinations, as you probably know. When you have total oh. sensory deprivation, there is hallucin <laughs> you hallucinate in that modality. And that's been reported before. I think it's called Charles Bonnet syndrome. Um, that's been reported in people who are starting to lose visual fields and they start seeing stuff in that blind spot, so to speak, in their visual field. So they try to, they fill it up somehow so they don't notice that there's some blind spot, but also they start seeing other things they shouldn't be seeing in their blind spot. So that's- you know, that, you, uh -huh. that, That's interesting from the standpoint of 
glutamate receptors, right? There's a drug called ketamine. Yeah. That kind of partially inhibits the NMDA receptor and it will induce hallucinations. Exactly. So that's that's one consequence of not having you know, total depri sensory deprivation is yeah. that you're starting having sensory hallucinations. And actually, Oliver Sacks had written a very interesting book about hallucina hallucination, which I read a little, you know, read a while ago because when I started listening to all of these people studying these uh, sensory deprivation and these sensory hallucinations, I thought, oh, I should read up on this and see what's going on. And he has a very interesting description of how these things work. And he has, he dissects out hallucination into two different categories. One that's sensory hallucination, which they, he, he describes it being emotionally detached and it's just very objective sensory hallucination versus schizophrenia type of hallucination. There's a lot of emotional context to that hallucination that makes people <laughs> fearful or have a uh, very uh, you know disturbing thoughts. Is, is there any evidence that, and of course, it's a little harder in mice or rats, but that when you blind them, <laughs> that they have, exhibit some behavior that might be suggestive they're having hallucinations? No, I mean that's the, that's the thing with it, working with animal models is that you can't go ask them, <laughs> right? Uh, that's that's the main problem. We can't interview them. Yeah. Whereas with these human subjects, okay. they can, okay. and of course they report they're having these visual hallucinations, and then sometimes they get too disturbed by it, they have to quit the. It, it is interesting though that, uh, so we're going to have one of these podcasts on depression and focus on mm -hmm. depression. It is interesting that things like ketamine that in and psychedelics uh, that cause hallucinations also have antidepressant effects. Uh, one thing that we haven't talked about at all now, um, I hope you have time, is, okay. is um, a protein called BDNF. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about BDNF because it's, in, it's produced in response to activation of synapses it's probably involved in some of these reorganizations and adaptations to sensory deprivation that you're talking about. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we've looked at BDNF in the context of visual cortex plasticity. Uh, so we know it's rapidly induced by activity. Um, and uh, actually by collaborating with Kerry Martinowitz at the uh, Lieber Institute, we actually had a paper on it. And our focus was examining how it affects the inhibitory circuit, which they seem to have a very profound effect on. So, you know, we, we know that activity dependent production of BDNF, because as you probably know about BDNF, they have uh, a promoter that's activity dependent, but they also basal uh, constitutive uh, promoter that drive, you know, baseline uh, level of BDNF synthesis. So what I had access to through Kerry was um, the activity dependent, you know, promoter was knocked out such that it would not produce BDNF when there's a lot of activity, but it still had the basal level of BDNF. And when we looked at that, uh, basically they impact the uh, changes in inhibitory synapses that's induced by uh, visual deprivation and deep uh, visual experience. So we know that it affects the inhibitory circuit, which regulates how information gets trafficked in the cortical circuit. So, so it's well affecting, affecting neurons that deploy GABA as their neurotransmitter. Exactly. So these are the GABA urgic synaptic transmission that's being affected. So that's as far as I've uh, wandered into the BDNF field. Um, I haven't looked at their effect in excitatory synapses, but others have looked at them. And you know they know that they can produce potentiation of all excitatory transmission and cause gene transcription that can lead to long-term consolidation of synaptic plasticity. So yeah. Anyway, I, I thought of that when I was thinking of, of depression because there's a lot of evidence that BDNF levels are down mm -hmm. in depression and that a variety of, of clinical treatments for depression electroconvulsive shock, uh, serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs, and ketamine, they all uh, boost BDNF levels. Uh, yeah, so we will see. But in either case, that means your brain is very dynamic in terms of what they respond to. 
Yeah. Um, and you know, hopefully we'll figure this out and try to optimize the brain plasticity as needed to either regain functionality or improve our functionality, uh, even in the adult brain, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, where are you going with your research now? What, what are your plans without giving away all your secrets? What are you... <laughs> I don't what, what, what questions <laughs> what questions would you like to answer in the the near um, and long term yeah of course i would like to see how this cross-modal plasticity can be used to actually uh encourage plasticity in the, in the adult brain and does the plastic changes lead to some behavioral uh enhancement as we predict they would so we are actually learning how to do behavior. So we are doing behavioral measurements. Uh, we're also looking at how information uh, coding is changing in vivo. So we started doing two photon imaging uh, while the, you know, with all of the sensory deprivation paradigms. So, then, so with that, that mm -hmm. so what, what Dr. Lee's doing is <laughs> he's essentially looking at calcium levels inside of neurons in living in the cerebral cortex of living mice. That's right. And, right. and when, when glutamate receptors are activated, calcium goes up in neurons. So by looking at calcium levels, you get an indication of which, mm -hmm. in which neurons the synapses have been activated. Yeah, definitely. And it's a readout of neural activity. So um, it, you can actually see a lot of neurons that are being activated at any moment. So we're trying to figure out how to analyze the data in a way that's meaningful to us. Um, but there are a lot to be learned. So I'm you know, enjoying learning these new techniques. Um, but hopefully we'll get some answers as to how this could be used for improving plasticity in the brain, because uh, that'll be one thing, but also to recover the lost senses, which will be another thing that we really want to, to be able to do. And that will make me very happy if my results can actually contribute to that uh, direction. Yeah, yeah. Well, they've already made really great contributions, and uh, I look forward to seeing how this evolves and, and translates, hopefully, to, to humans with various sensory deficits from injury or, or whatever other uh, cause. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me this morning. It was very, uh, it was a lot of fun talking to you. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed it. I haven't seen you for years, and uh, say... Hi to Alfredo. I haven't seen him for a long time either. No, definitely I will. Thank uh -huh. you. Okay. Bye. Bye.